form quantum theories in physics through a process known as quantization. That is the process of starting with some classical theory, say the classical theory of a single particle, and forming a quantum theory out of it. Now, according to Hans Halverson, even in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the theory of an electron or an atom, this process of quantization, constructing the quantum theory, doesn't yield a unique result. That is, if we start with the classical theory of a single particle moving on a line, and we go to form its quantum theory, we find many different quantum theories that we could use. What I'm going to argue today is that we can use topological structure on the class of physical quantities or observables to put substantive constraints on this process of theory construction, that is, the process of quantization. I'll argue for an approach to quantization on which the physical quantities associated with some system are represented in an algebra of observables that comes with topological structure. A virtue of this perspective is that it allows us to require continuity. That is, that the topology in our quantum theories preserves the topologies that we get in classical physics. I'll show that when we require our quantization procedure to be continuous in some of the relevant topologies, this actually narrows down the many options that we have for constructing our quantum theories. It helps us choose one of those quantum theories to use. More specifically, I'll argue that requiring continuity in what's known as the weak topology can help us rule out a standard option for constructing quantum theories a particular algebra of quantities known as the Weyl algebra. W what's at stake here? Well, Halverson argues, or, or really shows, that this Weyl algebra, this standard option to use as your quantum theory, it allows for special states, states with determinate positions. And these are, you know, were previously thought to not be physically possible in quantum theory. The received view is that quantum states are wave functions, that they're spread out over space. But Halverson shows that in addition to getting those wave function states, if one uses the Weyl algebra, the one also gets these states with determinate positions. By arguing that we should rule out this Weyl algebra, I'll also be ruling out these determinant position states, and so justifying that received view. The talk will proceed as follows. First, I'll present some preliminaries about quantum theory. Then I'll discuss the significance of these weak topologies that I'd like to use. And finally, I'll argue against the use of the Weyl algebra. Okay, so let's look at some basic features of the mathematical framework for quantum theory. We start with a C star algebra of observables, which I'll denote with this fractor A. Each element of this algebra represents some physical quantity of your system. That we have a C star algebra just means that we have a number of operations defined. In particular, give me any two quantities, A and B, I can add them to form A plus B. I can multiply them to form A times B. Importantly, multiplication in quantum theory is not commutative. I can take any quantity and multiply it by scalars. I can double A to get 2A. 
And in addition, I have a norm defined on my algebra. The norm of a quantity A denotes the maximum possible value that A can take on. This defines a notion of boundedness. Okay, one can use this structure of C star algebras to describe both classical and quantum physics. So here's our first example to illustrate it. A classical particle moving on a line. This particle has a phase space, R2. The points of R2 represent the states of that particle as it moves along this line. We have canonical coordinates Q and P, which represent the position of the particle and its instantaneous momentum. Now we can construct a classical algebra of quantities here, which just consists of some functions from our phase space to complex numbers, say. The algebraic structure here will be given by pointwise operations of multiplication and addition. The norm is the usual supremum norm. Now we can use this classical algebra of observables or quantities associated with the particle to construct an algebra of quantum quantities or observables. We're going to use what, what I'll call a quantization map, Q here, which is a bounded, linear, surjective map from our classical algebra, C, to a quantum algebra, A. This quantum algebra A that we get is obtained from that classical algebra by keeping everything the same except for the multiplication relation. Our new multiplication relation is defined by this equation, which implements what are called the canonical commutation relations. It tells us that position and momentum do not commute. One standard option for this quantum algebra, in particular, is what's known as the Weyl algebra. We'll call it W. It's generated by these functions, u of a and v of b, where a and b here are just real numbers. You notice they're exponentials of position and momentum. That's what keeps them bounded. Now, when we use these functions, u and v, then we get a particularly simple form of the commutation relations. One can show that this equation is formally equivalent to the canonical commutation relations on all of our observables. OK, so we've seen some examples of algebras to use for classical and quantum theories. In addition to the algebra, A, we get the dual space, A star, which consists of bounded linear mappings from our algebra A of quantities into complex numbers. There's some special elements of this dual space, the positive and normalized elements. Those ones are the physical states. Given one of these states, omega, the number that it assigns to a quantity A, so omega of A, represents the expectation value or average value of the quantity A in the state omega. For example, if we're looking at our classical theory, remember we've just got R2 here and we're looking at functions on R2. Well, a natural choice for the algebra of classical functions is what I'll call C0. That's the functions that vanish at infinity. Why is this a natural choice? Because when we look at the dual space to C0 and look at the states there, it turns out those are precisely the probability measures on our phase space. So they're a natural way of determining expectation values for our physical quantities. On the other hand, if we look at the Weyl algebra in quantum physics, 
we see that there are actually many different kinds of states that one gets. For example, we get both those wave functions and determinate position states. The way it look, works is that when you look for Hilbert space representations of this algebra, those are what you typically use for quantum theory, you find there's one Hilbert space representation that contains all of the wave functions as possible states. These are spread out over space. But there's also another Hilbert space, which contains a different collection of states that are also allowed. And these are the determinate position states. So both are allowed on the Weyl algebra for quantum theory. OK, now one can use this dual space to your algebra, so your collection of states, to define a topology on your physical quantities. This is going to capture a notion of approximation or similarity between our physical quantities. OK, so a net, which is just a generalized sequence of quantities in our algebra, converges. So if we've got AI converging to A in the weak topology, just in case for all elements of the dual space, the value phi of AI converges to phi of A in the usual topology on the complex numbers. This condition for convergence suffices to define the weak topology. Now, in classical physics, the weak topology has a very nice uh, characterization. Right? It's one that should be very familiar to us when we're dealing with functions. The weak topology on this classical algebra that we were talking about, C0, the functions that vanish at infinity, that's just the topology of pointwise convergence of functions on phase space. So for example, if we're looking at some of my favorite functions here, the bumps in the rug, we're going to take these bumps and let them get bigger and bigger. Intuitively, this sequence is flattening out to approach this horizontal line f. Well, the sense in which the sequence is converging is a notion of pointwise convergence. Right? For every point on our horizontal axis, so for every point in phase space, if we follow the values of these functions up the sequence, we eventually converge to that horizontal line f. OK, so this weak topology seems to have an obvious physical significance in classical physics. It's a notion of pointwise convergence. But what could be the significance of the weak topology in general, say in quantum physics? Okay, so far, we've seen this definition of the weak topology, which applies to both the classical and the quantum algebras. Now I'll argue that the weak topology has a particular physical significance when we're looking at quantization procedures. Remember that we defined a quantization map as a function that takes our classical quantities and promotes them to these quantum quantities in the algebra A. Well, if we have one of these quantization maps, then one can show that the weak topology on our quantum algebra has a particularly nice characterization as well. It's the coarsest topology that makes continuous every linear functional, think state, on the quantum algebra whose composition with the quantization map is bounded. So whose composition with the quantization map is also a nice linear functional on our classical algebra. Essentially what this tells us is that the weak topology makes continuous just those linear functionals that have the right classical structure. Or in other words, this proposition shows that the physical significance of the weak topology on the quantum algebra is intimately linked with the classical algebra that we're quantizing. And furthermore, this weak topology is important for physics for extending the algebras and the quantization maps that we're using to define observables like position and momentum. Remember, we started with a very, you know, might think of it as a small collection of physical quantities, the ones that vanish at infinity. There are plenty of other quantities that we'd like to talk about. 
Okay, here's how it works. If we look at any one of these algebras with the weak topology, we'll notice that it's not complete in the sense that there are sequences of functions or sequences of quantities which are converging in the weak topology, but they converge to some element that's outside of the space. But if you take a C star algebra, then you can show that it has a unique completion. Okay, this is the double dual, A star, A star star. That's always the completion of the C star algebra that we start with. Now, for our purposes, it won't matter what this double dual is. All that matters is that if you start with your original algebra of quantities and add limit points, then you get this new algebra that's bigger, the double dual. For example, if you start with the classical algebra of functions that vanish at infinity on phase space, remember I said this is a small you know, collection of physical quantities. Well, if you complete it in the weak topology, then you get a much larger collection, all of the bounded Borel functions. Now, if we're looking at a quantization map from some classical algebra of quantities to a quantum algebra of quantities, then you can show that you can extend that map in a continuous way to these double duals, right? to the bounded Borel function, say, and all the other quantities that we want in our quantum theory, just in case the quantization map is weakly continuous. Now that means that we need weak continuity of our quantization map in order to be able to extend this quantization procedure to all of the different quantities that we'd like to talk about. Say, position and momentum, the things that we think are you know, the real physical quantities associated with our system. Okay, so far we've seen some pieces of the physical significance of requiring weak continuity of our quantization map. Now I'll show that this can do real work for us. If we require weak continuity of our quantization map, then this rules out the Weyl algebra, that standard choice for quantizing the classical particle. The first thing to notice is that the Weyl algebra isn't a quantization of the algebra that I told you is the good one, the natural one to use in classical physics, right? Those functions that vanish at infinity. That algebra has the right state space, the probability measures, but you can't quantize it into the Weyl algebra. To get to the Weyl algebra, you have to start with what, you know, for lack of a, a better word, I'll call the classical Weyl algebra. To get this guy, we start with functions of this form, exponentials of position and momentum, in the classical case. Notice that this is exactly analogous to what you do in the quantum case to get the quantum Weyl algebra. It's these guys that we're going to quantize to get capital U and capital V. But if you do this, then one can show that this quantization map from the classical Weyl algebra to the quantum Weyl algebra is not continuous in the relevant topologies. That is, the topology of pointwise convergence on our classical functions and the weak topology on the quantum Weyl algebra. Remember, the topology of pointwise convergence is the one that has manifest physical significance. It encodes a notion of similarity or approximation of functions. Ones that, you know, a notion of approximation similarity that we're all familiar with. Because we don't have this continuity in the relevant topologies, one can't extend the Weyl algebra or this quantization map to the Weyl algebra to get our you know, manifestly physically significant quantities or observables. You can't get your position and momentum unless you add some further constraints. But on the other hand, there's another quantization procedure that we can use that does start with the classical algebra that I said is the natural one to use. 
We can start with this classical algebra of functions that vanish at infinity, right, with the right state space, the probability measures. To quantize that, we use a procedure called Berezin quantization. It maps the classical algebra, C0, these functions that vanish at infinity, into a different quantum algebra. This K here is the algebra of compact operators on a Hilbert space. And if you do that, you can prove that this Berezin quantization map from the functions that vanish at infinity into the compact operators, turns out that is continuous in the relevant topologies, in the topology of pointwise convergence on our classical functions and the weak topology on our quantum algebra. This means that one can immediately extend the Berezin quantization procedure to get quantum observables of position and momentum. When you do that, you notice that there are no determinate position states on this quantum algebra that we've arrived at, the algebra of compact operators. In a sense, there's a unique Hilbert space representation of this algebra. And this representation contains only the wave functions but not these determinate position states. Okay, so what have we learned? I think we've learned that requiring weak continuity of our quantization map is a real tool that we can use in the construction of quantum theories. Doing this substantively constrains the construction of our quantum theories. We've seen that it rules out this vial algebra it rules out those determinate position states. And it gets us really just where we want to be using those wave functions for quantum mechanics. Thank you.